Hello, everyone. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Welcome to WordCamp Philly. I moved to Philadelphia in 1988, and I love this city with all of my heart. Philadelphia was founded in 1682 by William Penn. The name Philadelphia itself contains one of the ancient Greek words for love. Phila, love, friendship, or affection. Adelphos, brotherly or sisterly. Philadelphia has a long and pretty decent relationship with love. In 1780, Pennsylvania was the first state to repeal its anti-interracial marriage law. And that is 187 years before Loving versus Virginia made interracial marriage legal nationwide. In 1965, Philadelphia opened John F. Kennedy Plaza, who we all know it as Love Park. In 2009, West Philly native Steve Powers created an art installation called A Love Letter for You. It is a series of 50 rooftop murals from 45th to 63rd Street along Market Street. And you can see all of the murals while riding the L. SEPTA even had a Valentine's Day love train for a number of years. They don't do it anymore, but hopefully it'll bring it back one day. And the Valentine's Day love train will go slowly down Mark Street by all these murals. And you could even have your wedding on the train. I don't know if that's having your wedding on the L is either the most amazing thing or the grossest thing you can do. <laughs> Just a few weeks ago, on the 30th anniversary for National Coming Out Day, the Mayor's Office of LGBTQ Affairs held an Out for Love wedding event at City Hall. This event is extra special because of another famous Philadelphian, activist Edie Windsor. Edie was born in 1960, and she grew up in Philadelphia, attending Philly Public Schools, and she graduated from Temple University in 1950, and later, she worked for IBM for 16 years. She started there as a mainframe programmer. And she left with the highest level technical position at IBM of senior systems programmer. In 1965, Edie began a college via Spire. In 1977, Edie was diagnosed with progressive multiple sclerosis. In 2002, she suffered a heart attack, and in 2007, Dr. Coles Thea that she only had a year left to live. So with that news, after 42 years together, they got legally married in Canada. Thea wound up dying in 2009, and after she died, she was required to pay over $150,000 in the state taxes after inheriting her state and she wouldn't have had to pay that money if their marriage was legally recognized. She filed a lawsuit that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 2013, because of Edie's tenacity, the Supreme Court found the Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional, and same-sex marriage became legal across the United States. at the age of 88, and just a few weeks ago, Philly renamed the block 13th Street between Walnut and Locust, Edie Windsor Way. Philadelphia lady changed millions of lives, including mine, with the power of love. <laughs> now, Philadelphia We have an independent spirit as well. We always get along with others. 
But sometimes a task calls for independence. Even if people tell you, sometimes we need to take risks and approach a challenge with a strategy that is independent of what is considered safe. When we take big risks, sometimes we can attain great reward. I can literally watch that like a hundred times. <laughs> On September 24, 2018, Philadelphia took what may have been one of its biggest risks in its entire history. <laughs> the fires unveiled ready its new official mascot. And the backlash was swift and brutal. <laughs> there was a go to use the nice Gritty. <laughs> National TV shows were making fun of Gritty. John Oliver went on a really long rant trashing Gritty. And Twitter complained about Philly getting it wrong again. And then the meme started, the meme started rolling in. <laughs> Had the Flyers made a huge mistake? Should they have listened to the criticisms and revised the, mag the new mascot to be less scary? But then, something else happened. People started to understand Gritty. Gritty got a bigger named after them, which is a very silly thing to do. A couple had a Gritty wedding cake for their wedding. Gritty went from frightening Muppet Show reject a lovable monster. Suddenly, Philly was Team Gritty. Restaurants started making gritty, gritty themed foods like cupcakes. People were dressing their kids up as gritty. And we had the inevitable gritty tattoo. <laughs> the Flyers nailed it. Gritty captured the independent, bold thinking of Philadelphia. They took a risk powered through the backlash, and rewarded with a big success. Right now, the WordPress is going through its own gritty moment. Gutenberg. <laughs> Since WordPress 2.0, TinyMC has been the default WordPress editor. That was 13 years ago. It's one big editor with a visual and a text mode and some formatting buttons to insert HTML tags around content without needing to know code. For those of you not familiar with Gutenberg, it is a new block style editor coming to WordPress 5, along with a completely redesigned post and page editing screen. Gutenberg has been over two years in the making and will be released as early as November 19. Instead of one big editor for everything, each piece of is placed with its own block, with its own settings. Change is hard, right? But sometimes you have to make a dramatic change to evolve. This is me and my friend, Mika Epstein. You may know her from numerous WordCamps around the world or her involvement with the WordPress plugin directory. Her and I built and run a site called Let's Watch TV, which is a database of queer, female, non-binary, and transgender television characters and their shows. Right now, our database has over 3,000 characters and 1,000 shows. We love health. And in addition to keeping the database up to date, we also write about TV for the website. One year ago, in this very building, at this very event, I came up with the idea to start a weekly column where I would recap all the shows I saw the previous week that had LGBT content. And on Monday, I was a second <laughs> This will mark one year of writing weekly. I have built 
various websites. But to be honest, I have never before written a website. Now, this, we can install the Gutenberg plugin on the site. And I, a person who never even used the visual tab in the editor to write content, decided to start using Gutenberg for my weekly post. I'll be honest with you, we went from this to this. It was anger, there was cursing. Whenever my wife Mia heard me yelling at my laptop, she knew I was working on my post in Gutenberg. I have always formatted my content in Gutenberg, but therein lies the problem. I believe I'm doing a good job by building well-crafted tools for people to use, by focusing on code and back-end efficiency. But I was not doing enough to experience managing a site from the user's perspective. Our users never see our beautiful code. They only see the admin interface day after day as they manage the content on their site. As the week passed, Gutenberg and it itself got better with every. Um, I and I absolutely fell in love with the redesigned editing system in general. It was much more organized and easy to use, and I really improving my writing workflow. Um, Mika also made us some really cool custom blocks for things like listicles, spoiler warnings, and other content that we use repeatedly on the site. Those custom blocks made the code behind our content better. Um, because to get things to look correctly in tiny MCE, you have to make some hacky HTML. And even though at this point I was on board uh, the Gutenberg train, I've been teaching press classes and I really love it and enjoy it. And I benefit from it as well because it exposes me to the new user experience. I've had the privilege of seeing groups of people who have never used WordPress before, people who are brand new to WordPress, experience both the classic editor and Gutenberg, and they overwhelmingly prefer the blocks. I yet to meet somebody who prefers the classic editor. There'll be bumps in the road, but now I'm a fan. I'm really excited to see a Gutenberg feature. So it has a lot of firsts. First library, the first public protest against slavery, the first hospital. And this picture was taken inside the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, which is the first. In 1946, the University of Pennsylvania introduced ENIAC, the electric, Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. It was, in 1946, unveiled to the public. The first programmers for ENIAC were a group of six women chosen from 200 women employed as computers at the University of Pennsylvania Moore School of Electrical Engineering. The job of being a computer was to produce mathematical formulas with mechanical calculators needed for engineering studies and projects. Their names were Betty Holberson, Francis Spence, Jean Bartik, Kay Antonelli, Marilyn Meltzer, and Ruth Tilebaum. By the way, Francis, Kay, Betty, and Marilyn were all Philadelphians. There were no programming languages or guides at the time, so they just had to figure it out. <laughs> These women got to know the machine so well that they could troubleshoot bugs faster than the engineers who built them. Um, the women program ENIAC to perform complex sequences of operations, including loops, branches, and subroutines. And 
This, these are like the first programmers in the world. John Mulcahy and Presper Eckert were the inventors of ENIAC, and they planned this big grand public unveiling of this machine, which was previously top secret up until this time because it was used for the military. Um, and they planned this for February 15, 1946. At the event, they wanted to do a live demo of a missile trajectory calculation and they knew they needed the women's help to pull it off. Two weeks before the event, they talked to the women, told them what they wanted to do, and asked them if they could pull it off in time. And they were like, yes. They stepped up to the challenge, and they made it happen. They worked nonstop for those two weeks. And at the demonstration, ENIAC was able to generate a set of missile trajectory calculations in 15 seconds, something that would have taken humans several weeks to reproduce. The event was a huge success. The unveiling of ENIAC made the front page of the New York Times, and the press was calling it a giant brain. That night, in UPenn's Houston Hall, they held a big celebratory dinner, but the ENIAC programmers were not even invited. And following the event, the people who got credit for ENIAC success were these two. Nowadays, programmers are seen as people who make the magic happen, right? Um, but back then, it was considered a fair task. The people who designed and built the hardware. We felt as if we'd been playing parts in a fascinating movie that suddenly took a bad turn, in which we had worked like dogs for two weeks to produce something really spectacular and then were written as a script. The programmers were essentially erased from the story for decades. Historians mistakenly identified the women in the photos as refrigerator ladies, meaning they were models in front of the equipment to make uh, the product with it. Women were never publicly recognized for their work with So, what are the residual effects of erasing the team of women who were the programmers to the world's first electronic digital computer for history? Women twice as likely than men to leave the tech industry altogether. And the numbers get worse when you look at women of color. When you don't see yourself represented in an industry, you don't know it's a career you can have, even if there is zero correlation between the ability to perform well in tech and who you are as a person. Affordable programs for women to learn web and software development through in-person classes. And we're lucky here in Philadelphia because Philly is one of the most active chapters of Girl Develop It. Um, it has helped launch the careers of dozens of women who were not involved in tech at all before. And also, Girl the curriculum for and teach a series of classes at the Baylor Women's Correctional Institution in Delaware, um, from intro to web concepts to HTML and CSS and WordPress. Um, I just finished my last class for this technical course. Oh, and by the way, the students there were first. <laughs> now, I want to issue a challenge to you all. Some things you can try to do in the next 12 months to help make the WordPress community better. I offer you to take the Philadelphia Love Independence First Challenge. Number one, operate from a place of fun. Fear keeps us from moving forward. When we want to be proactive and then do nothing because we're afraid of what people may think, that keeps the status quo, which is worse 
than trying. There is no such thing as perfection. We all make mistakes. Getting out of your comfort zone, meeting people unlike you, and making new friends is fun. Taking risks can be beneficial and helpful. Make your next 20 Twitter followers people not like you. Here's a place to start. These are 10 national organizations teaching people from underrepresent, who are underrepresented in tech to code. Follow their executive directors and tune into the conversations they're having. Show support without inserting yourself into the conversation. We could all stand to listen more and talk less. When someone who is not like you gives you a view of their life from their perspective, it is a gift. Take it in, and if it moves you, show your support with a retweet or the like button. Go to a networking event where everyone is just like you. Even if you are used to regularly being the only person like you in the room, you can find an event with folks that are new to you. Uh, you could try going to an open captioned movie, or attend a presentation or performance of a person with a different background. In Philadelphia, we have multiple diverse tech networking groups. Um, Meetup.com is a great resource to find groups in your area. Go to their networking events or public events. Groups want their events to be well attended. Um, don't let the fear of not being welcome prevent you from expanding your network. Liam went to a Lesbians in Tech event and had a great time. <laughs> and, and this, you know, I don't want to out you, but you're not a lesbian. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> in Philadelphia, we have an assortment of diverse chambers of commerce, and membership is open to allies. People go to chamber events because they want to find people they can potentially do business with. And all of these organizations have sponsorship opportunities where you can help the diverse business community and get involved with their networks. Try to make sincere, real connections with people. TA, a girl developed a class. Multiple times I've heard, I would hire women if there were any. Well, women and non-binary folks make up 51% of the population. So just because someone doesn't know any women in tech doesn't mean they don't exist. Anyone, regardless of their gender orientation. It's fun, rewarding, and you will be exposed to a wealth of amazingly talented people. Don't only where the speaker or writer refers to hypothetical, fictitious programmers, developers, hires, and clients as he, him, and guys. When referring to hypothetical people, use gender-neutral pronouns, or switch back and forth equally. It is so simple to do, and it'll really help change this default association of people in tech equaling people. And non-cis male folks will notice that you're doing it, and it telegraphs a value of an inclusive culture. Don't accept homogeneity as normal. This is one of my heroes, Shonda Ryan. Um, she is an award-winning creator of many television shows like Grey's Anatomy, Private Practice, Scandal, How to Get, Get Away with Murder, Station 19, and many others. Shonda is a very successful woman. She has a net worth of over $120 million. What has been one of the keys to Shonda's success? entertaining and addictive, Shonda's program is also incredibly diverse and appealed to the widest audience possible. Almost everyone will see a person from their demographic, demographic reflected back to them as a character on one of her shows. Ironically, 
Shonda doesn't like the word diversity. She says, I have a different word, normalizing. I am making TV look like the world looks. Women, people of color, LGBTQ people equal way more than 50% of the population, which means it ain't out of the ordinary. Diversity for diversity's sake implies you are assembling an artificial group of people just for the look of diversity. Instead of diversity for diversity's sake, it should be diversity for normalizing's sake. Reality is diverse. Homoge homogeneity is a world like the Smurfs, and that is not Some examples are slide decks, examples, hypothetical people, photos, panels, speakers. If you are ever in the position of putting together one of these things, make sure the people involved reflect the reality we live in. And if you are ever invited to a panel just like you, say something. Because the organizers may not even realize that they've created All have Research proves all of us grew up learning bias. It's okay. It's not something to spend time feeling bad about, but instead, spend time consciously working on it. Professor Chicago sent fictitious resumes to 1,300 Help Wanted ads in the Boston Globe and the Chicago Tribune. And they measured the success of these resumes um, by the number of callbacks that they received. The resumes were all identical, except for one thing. Half the resumes had a white-sounding name, and the other half had an applicant. The applicants with the white-sounding names were 50% more likely to be called in for an interview. In a Yale University randomized double-blind study, 127 US STEM professors asked to evaluate resumes. Again, the resumes were identical, except for one thing. Half had the name John, and the other half had the name Jennifer. Participants rated John significantly higher than Jennifer, and the ones that would hire Jennifer offered her 13% less in salary per year than John. Now, the most disturbing part of this study is that it did not matter the gender of the person reviewing the resumes. Both women and men rated John higher than Jennifer, which means that we all have bias no matter who we are. The next time you're in a position to hire, approve a speaker for a conference, or any situation where you are reviewing people, Think hard while your first impulse may be to turn someone down and strive for a true meritocracy. Nearly a third of all websites use WordPress, and with that comes a huge responsibility. Who is participating in the creation of the software, and who feels comfortable joining this community? We can't fall into the homogeneity creating for a reality trap. We all have a responsibility to make the community better. Use the loving, independent, and pioneering spirit of Philadelphia with all its good and bad to guide you and help make a better internet. Thank you very much. questions, don't ask me.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. That was an excellent, excellent topic to go away from it. Um, Thank you. As someone who is in a position uh, of hiring, I found that one of the questions I asked people why I was hiring people used to be asking for social media profiles and I wanted to see a little bit more about them. Mm -hmm. uh, now that this is actually a terrible no, mistake, this is my perspective because it introduced so many of these biases, whether it's conscious or unconscious for me. Um, I'm wondering if there are any kind of strategies you have for like, I'm trying to keep it going through an entire hiring process without even like knowing someone's name and like just like, keep it unbiased. I mean, that may be taking to the extreme, but like either I'm all in or even if it's you're just have a little bit of bias that's affecting it. So is there any kind of strategies towards really minimizing that bias and trying to hide some of that bias for as long as possible through that process? Coincidentally, um like I I've given a diversity talk a lot of different uh, conferences and I've done so much research on unconscious bias that it, I think that is such a big key to the problem, the problem with the lack of diversity in the tech community because of research that has been done on unconscious bias. So for the past, gosh, over a year, we've actually been working on a plugin called Level Playing Field um, that will allow people to post job listings and have anonymized job applications come in. So you're not looking at names, you're not looking at when a person graduated, you're not looking at the, their zip code, um, or anything that would be a tell of who they are as a person. You're only looking at qualifications, skills, and things like that. Because I really think that that is one piece of the puzzle for fighting bias. Um, so that should be, we're looking for uh, January to launch that <laughs> in the directory. We're working hard um, to get that done. But yeah, I think at, right now what people do is they have someone go through and actually like, you know, like cross out all the identifying names and things and then hand it to, you know, the hiring managers. Um, but that takes a lot of time. So it would be great if you just have them all come in. And what the plugin will do is allow you to message back and forth with the person. And then once an uh, uh, appointment is made for an interview, that's when... Uh, the names are revealed because it's getting people to the door. Once they're in the door, I can't I can't help at that point. But I just want to get people with their foot in the door. I didn't mean for that to be an infomercial for our <laughs> <laughs> plug-in, but. <laughs> There's a question over here. Oh. Are your slides available? Yes, I'm gonna. I'll tweet them out. A link to them after I'm done. Hi. I have a question. So I work in like industrial products, like hoses. So all men. Right. <laughs> um, and I have three females that I work with. They're lovely girls. But I think the biggest problem we face is I don't want to come off like the guys that we work with aren't fantastic. They are. I mean, they sent me here to learn more about how I can help their business. But I don't always think they know how sexist they come off as. Um, we have this thing called a leadership program. Not one woman, not myself either, my work with their corporate, was invited. And I actually had my coworker call me. She's like, her boss literally told her, oh, they didn't pick you because you're female. Oh, my gosh. Ooh. And she, um, her name is Casey, she is like a superhero. You know, she works with me. She's not marketing, but she's like there, so... I just want to know, from my standpoint of marketing and in corporate, what I can do to kind of, I don't want to cut off and like, there's a such sexist that none of the girls feel like they can, you know, achieve anything, mm -hmm. but I want to influence them to, yeah, send Casey to this or make her a general manager so that, you know, you know we're not dumb. We know how, I mean, you trust us to sell your stuff, but you don't trust us to, you know, do anything else. So I just wanted to know, like, if you had any, like, pointers on how I can kind of push them more towards just letting us be as successful as we can be. Right. I and mean, that's hard because it, it, it's falling on you to be the advocates for yourself to make this better, which is unfair, right? Because that's, that's the inclusion piece. It's like you can hire diverse folks, but if there is no inclusion happening, they're going to leave. 
and they're not going to feel like part of the team. I mean, I don't know about your particular situation, but do you, is there any of the people there that you would consider, any of the men there you consider to be an ally? Yeah. It's a superhero. So I don't know. I've been like basically just guys get her to go to this, send her to this, and stuff. And I guess that's like. Is cool. there? I mean, is there any way that you could approach the president who you feel is an ally and talk to them, talk to him, like have an honest conversation? And because so, you know people get really defensive, and if he and unfortunately, and, and this is the this is the thing about allies. It's like allies are so important. I would not have the rights I have today without allies, without straight allies, right? So. The work that allies do, unfortunately, if they're not going to listen to you, they may listen to him. So if he can be on your side and you can just, you know, instead of like, you know, yelling at the other guys who will then get defensive and then maybe not listen to you and just dismiss you, if you can have an honest conversation with the president and get him on your side and work together to make things better. Because he has to understand that his business is suffering with a homogeneous uh, workforce. It's like he, he could be making more money, he could be more productive, um, he could make better products if he had a more diverse team. So it's in their best interest to have more women working there and, and more people of all kinds working there and uh, have everyone feel included and happy. That's how I would approach it. I'm sorry, that stinks. <laughs>